Good afternoon. Hi. My name is Paul Musgrave. I'm Special Assistant to the Director at the Richard Nixon Presidential Library and Museum. It's March 10th. We're in the National Archives Building in Washington, D.C., and I have the honor and privilege to be interviewing Henry Cashin. Mr. Cashin, welcome. Thank you. It's a privilege to be here. Uh, I want to ask you a question because uh, a lot of the description of the White House staff uh, focuses on the fact that there are a lot of UCLA alumni out there, but uh, you were part of a smaller clique of Brown alumni. Tell us about Brown University and how you got started. Well, Brown didn't have anything to do with Nixon other than, than having watched the debates uh, at, at the university from a one wonderful professor I had who thought it would be uh, a real lesson in political science with a political science course to uh, not only watch the debates of 1960 but to listen to them. And that's where it was a great course because you saw the debates and you saw the contrast of the, on television of President Nixon and then uh, Senator Kennedy and then he would play the audios. And there was no question of who was answering the questions, who was deeper, who had more command of the knowledge. And you know, he came to the poll of the class uh, as to uh, you know, who, was, who, who, was, who won the debates. Uh, and no question on, on just uh, with the radio, Nixon won, and on TV it was, uh, it was Kennedy. But um, I'm from uh, Detroit, Michigan originally, and I ended up going to Brown because that's where I chose to go to school. And, and having gone to uh, boarding school in New England beforehand, and uh, um, was interested in, in uh, uh, young Republicans in, in college, uh, did some work for uh, Eisenhower in, uh, just as a as volunteer when he ran um, and, and it was with, with, for Nixon in 1960. Um, just as a college student, but um, there was a, a wonderful guy uh, who was a great friend of mine by the name of Nick Rui. Um, these other fellows might have mentioned it too, but uh, Nick was, he worked for, for uh, the president when he was vice president. And um, I can back up into any, any part of Brown if you want. Brown was a great university. I had a wonderful time there, played football, did all sorts of things academically, and did a, did a great deal on the campus, and then went to Michigan Law School after that. Uh, and then was working at a Detroit law firm, uh, the Dickinson Wright Law Firm in Detroit, which was the largest firm in Michigan. And uh, Nick, who, as I said, was a great friend who I used to see on a regular basis, called up one day, and he said, are you still interested in Nixon? This is 1966, and I said, well, I, you know, I'm uh, interested in him. I mean, he ran a great campaign in 60. I think he got, he got robbed in the election, but what, what's up? So he said, meet me after work. We went to the university club after work, and uh, he said uh, um, that he, was, he, being Nixon, was running a congressional campaign stumping for Republican congressmen all over the country in 66, and would I be interested in, in getting involved? And I said, well, yeah, I'd, I'd get involved, and it sounds like it would be fun, but what, what, what would we do? He said, we'd be doing advance work. And I said, well, you know, I'd never really done much advance work, uh, but yeah, I'd give it a try, Nick. And he, I said, so where do we go from here? He said, Let, we'll go up to New York tomorrow. So uh, I said, well, that, uh, that's great. Uh, so <laughs> we, uh, uh, up, the next day was a Saturday. We jumped on a plane. We went up to uh, Mudge Rose Law Firm. Uh, we visited for with with Nixon for a while. Had a great visit, and the, he Nixon said to me, "I'd like you to leave for Indiana on Monday." And I said, "Mr. Nixon, that that uh, uh, that would be great, but I've just recently started my law firm, and I'm not so sure I can just take off for for six or seven weeks and not show back up in the office." And he said, uh, "Well, doesn't Robert McKean have something to do with that law firm?" I said, yeah, he sure does. He's a senior man. And he got Rose Woods in, and he called uh, Robert McKean out in Gross Point, Michigan, got him off the golf course, and uh, he said, Bob uh, uh, Nixon, he said, uh, just looking for you to make a contribution to the Republican Party this fall. And I was thinking McKean must have said something about he'd send his check in. Well, he said, oh, Bob, you're, you're like clockwork. You know, we, we never worry about you. Wish we had as many financial regulars as you. He said, I'm gonna, I want to borrow a person from you. And he says, Henry Cash, and he's going to be gone for about seven or eight weeks. Fine with you, Bob? Fine, fine. It's done. 
So that was it. I left for Indiana on Monday, <laughs> went home and packed and took off and traveled all around with the uh, um, group that we had in that campaign, traveled to Indiana, we went to Arkansas, we went back and forth to New York and uh, flew around on the Reader's Digest plane, which was uh, donated by the Wallace family. Hope Lewis was really the benefactor of that one. And uh, Pat Buchanan was, was on there, Charlie McWhorter, John Whitaker was the desk man. Anyhow, that's how I started. And I did, I did advance work and never really stopped working for Nixon. I did some uh, non-public, non-political non events for him in the fall of 1967. And then we all met in, in New York in late fall of 1967, being the guys that were involved with him to he let us know that he was kicking off the campaign. Who did you, uh, who did you work for in Indiana? What was the ten candidate you were stumping for? Jeez, I, I can't even remember. I ran around all over in Indiana. Uh, I don't even know. I can't even remember whether uh, any of them won. I, I don't remember the, n the names of, of any of them. The, they were all House members. The, the most interesting um, uh, part of the event, which le left a lasting impression, was that uh, we went to Anderson, Indiana, <laughs> Anderson, Indiana, Terre Haute, Indiana. Uh, I can remember that in Terre Haute, Indiana, and Nick came out, he was with me in Terre, Nick Rui, Terre Haute, that the Clyde LaBellet, who was a renowned big time basketball player that's going back into the early 50s, who was, who was, he was the sheriff. And, um, uh, you know, it was just impressive seeing, seeing LaBellet out there. But when we uh, got, showed up at the, uh, the airport on one occasion, there was a woman who came up to me. This is, I, th I believe this was in Terre Haute or Columbus, Indiana. Went to both of them. And then Anderson was the wrap up. Uh, and there's a funny story about that too. Uh, um, and she came up and said, I was a young guy, I was 25 years old, and said, uh, I, I just want to come and say hello to uh, the former vice president that I worked for him during the Alger Hiss hearings when Rose Woods was sick. And I just want to come in. So I'm thinking to myself, wow, uh, I got to get a message to him uh, that Jane Doe is here. And uh, we were talking, and, and um, I don't forget who it was. Somebody said, well, he usually gets off the plane last, so as soon as a uh, plane door opens up, you, you come on, get on, and give him, give him, the, give him the message, and he'll, he'll be cool with that. And uh, so the plane lands, and door opens. Who's the first guy off? It's Nixon. And he looks at this woman, and he went right up to her and remembered her name. He said, Alder History, and she worked for him for 10 days. And uh, we shook her hand and chatted with her privately for a while, knew her name, knew the whole deal. And then he went back to work the crowd a little bit and uh, hopped in the car and off we went. Uh, but it was, uh, and, and we, we closed up, we wrapped, it, wrapped up in Indiana. I spent a lot of time in Indiana, um, in Anderson, Indiana. And uh, I mean, the, the, the astuteness of the, the gentleman, we, the, all of the, the party leaders we're on the platform in Anderson, Indiana, so I got back and and was going to brief him on the local issues. He all knew, he knew all the local issues, and uh, he said, "Has anybody checked on Charlie Halleck? Where is he sitting?" And uh, I said, "I think he's next to you." He said, "I'll find out how much he's had to drink." He said, "We're going to be on national TV. This is going to be taped, and I don't want him falling over on me if he's had too much to drink." And so we went back out, and I, I said to somebody, can you check and find out? And he said, yeah, he's been drinking this morning. I said, you've got to move him to the back. You don't, the, the vice president doesn't, doesn't want him next to him in case something you know, goes sideways. And I, it's just an example. He, he had his antenna were up on everything. And uh, Eddie Evan um, went back to, uh, to New York and, and uh, had a great time in New York with him. We, he let everybody out on the town, and you know, it was, it was 1966 was a huge year for the Republicans, and and he was uh, well on his way to having solidified support from the various state chairmen uh, in all the states that he campaigned. 
I'm just, you know, this is this is not something that they cover in advanced band school, how to move the minority leader back to the back of the hall. Mm -hmm. Nixon was telling me what to do. I mean, that, I mean, that was, uh, and the, the state chairman had to do that after, after we were told, but he had him sitting right next to Nixon on the platform. What was this trip like? I mean, you, uh, you, you should be able to just compare it to the other uh, trips that Nixon the, the, would take the, later. The, I mean, the trips were, were, were great. They were very informal. How many he, people? Uh, I would guess on the, on the plane there were uh, five or six. And uh, Clint Wheeler, Charlie McWhorter, uh, Pat Buchanan, Pat Hillings, uh, I believe, was, was traveling that. Whitaker didn't go much. Uh, and I'm trying to think of whether John Davies was aboard on that, who was a personal aide to, to uh, uh, the vice president then. Um, Rose Woods, when she got, she sometimes traveled, sometimes didn't. Uh, I forget who took her place when when uh, uh, weren't going. And, but it was a, it was a small crowd. We had a handful of advanced men. Rui was doing it. I was doing it. I forget who who else was doing it. Uh, Roy Goodearl. Was was out on the road, there, but there weren't many. I mean, we were we were spread out, and it was it was it was uh, you learned by fire. I mean, you get thrown out there, and you knew what you had to do. And, and Nick had done a lot of it, and, and uh, so I, you know, I picked it up, and and uh, whether whatever it was, I had somewhat of an instinct for it because I did a lot of it in '68, a lot of it, and uh, you know, he he announced to the group, I forget where where we were, what what apartment or hotel that in. Uh, um, November of 67, December 67, uh, November must have been November 67 that he was going for it. And if anybody that, that didn't want to get involved, no, no hard feelings, bail out now, because once you get locked in, we're, we're, we're going for it. And he was going to uh, register in New Hampshire, and he was going to head into the primary. And that was it. That was the start of the campaign. How did you square that with the law firm? I took, I, I took off. Took a leave of absence. I, I was I was going. <laughs> I used to go back and, and check in and uh, you know see the guys. Uh, I had no idea what I was doing. I got married in the summer of '67, so it wasn't a great first year to be to be married. And uh, but I was I was gone uh, from I think January until the convention. I, mean, I was gone that whole year until November. Just about, uh, I spent the whole year on the road. Did you go to the advanced band school? I guess I did. Yeah, I can't remember who even ran that. Maybe John Niedecker. Uh And it eventually sorted out. Rui went up to New Hampshire, and this fellow Roy Goodrell went to, uh, um, uh, who are great friends of mine, went to Wisconsin. Uh, I spent a lot of time in Wisconsin. Uh, and then went to Oregon after that. And I, I believe it was after a couple of stops in, in uh, Oregon that uh, uh, Bobby Kennedy was, was shot, and that's when he stopped campaigning. I always remember uh, a, a stupid statement of mine, an in insight into the, into the former president. Uh, we came into Salem, Oregon, and there was there was a crowd, an odd crowd that was odd. By, by I mean, they weren't they weren't put together to see him. And there was a lot of activity going going uh, on in the in the hotel we were staying in. And uh, we came in, came up to the room, and he said, "What was all that going on in the in the the uh, down in the lobby there?" And I said, "A bunch of idiots down there. I don't know what they were doing." He said, "Let me tell you something. That's the last time I ever hear want to hear you use that word to describe anybody." So as long as you're working for me, those are all good people, and I don't want to hear any type of an adjective put on them that describes anybody in a derogative way. Boy, I learned fast. And, uh, you know, we went on. He had great, great events in, in Oregon. We stopped. Uh, there was a lot of communication, a lot of organizing. And um, then I got back into it again. There were three of us who were in charge of the first family down in Miami and headed out down to Miami. Uh, for, I, I think I went down there for three weeks, and uh, we, <laughs> the group all stayed at the place called the Runaway Bay Club, and, uh, uh, you know, it was, it was, uh, 
it, 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 not only was it, it was a challenge, everybody worked hard, you were learning hard, you knew, you knew enough at that point to have a little confidence in what you were doing, but um, uh, it, was, it was a lot of camaraderie, a lot of wonderful people. And I'll never, you know, never forget the the, uh, the the highs, the lows, the ups and downs, the stories from the from the convention, which were well, there were a lot of them, and uh, they were great. Um, but uh, uh, Nixon had got the we got the group together. <laughs> I'm laughing to myself thinking of we were trying to. Uh, uh, Wilfa Stilt Chamberlain was down there at the point, the point, and people were looking around as, as uh, he, he was going going to events and, and talking to people about the, the, then the candidate, and uh, he didn't complain didn't have enough clothes, so we had to go out and get him clothes so he he looked well suited up. How many people could, uh, tailors could you find? You know, you get a tailor-made suit for Wilt Chamberlain, it cost as much as ten suits. But at uh, one point, he, he uh, told Mitchell that, that he and Ehrlichman and Haldeman were in charge of, of um, they, they arrived. It was during, during the, the primaries, they hadn't showed up at all. And uh, I first met John, in, uh, who I eventually worked for, um, in Miami. And, uh, and same with Haldeman, Ziegler. I'd known Ziegler before. He was he was working in, in uh, uh, the primary states at the at the tail end. Um, anyhow, he, Nixon um, he he got everybody together and said, uh, uh, "Miami, now I don't want you guys running around getting worried about this thing. We're going to win the nomination." He said, "What I'm worried about is we're going to win the election and start thinking about that. Start thinking about beyond beyond the the uh, uh, the convention." And we kind of adjourned, and he turned to Haldeman. I believe it was Haldeman or Mitchell. I don't remember whether Mitchell was around much uh, during that time in, in Miami. But uh, probably he was. Uh, it was either Haldeman or Mitchell. And said, uh, however, quietly to them, I want to get the Miami delegation together, I mean the Florida delegation together and pull them. I'm worried that they're coming loose. Yeah, I mean, he spoke with total confidence to the whole group, but he was, you know, he wanted to lock, we wanted to lock that thing up on the first ballot, which was tight. I forget whether it was Wisconsin uh, or what, what state it was that put it over the top. Uh, and John Sears was, was still very much involved, but he, it, once Agnew got picked, then uh, uh, Sears and Rui and Goodall all went off with, uh, with Agnew. And uh, there were a group of about four or five of us who were lead advance men that took off from there. Ron Walker, myself, Easy Ed Morgan, uh, Boyd Gibbons, John Niedecker. And we took off for the first five stops that, that he was going to make and start, start to put those together. Um, did not go to Mission Bay, went back to, to uh, Washington, I mean back to Detroit and uh, got ready to go f full time uh, after Labor Day. And uh, then, you know, it was, I got, I mean, this, this is a lot of history. Uh, stop me, I can cut all this, this short, but it was, um, you know, it was flat out from, uh, uh, from that right after Labor Day to, uh, uh, to the election. And I took, went from, uh, to California, to uh, Santa Clara, uh, met with Bob Finch in, in San Francisco. We went out to Santa Clara, looked at this foot, big football stadium, and uh, I said, so what are we doing here? And he said, you're going to fill it. And I said, uh, geez, uh, governor, he was lieutenant governor at that point, uh, you know, has this place ever been filled other than for a football game? He said, Bobby Kennedy had a rally out here, and he filled about half of it. He said, but good luck, I gotta go back to Sacramento. And he took off, and uh, uh, we filled it. And uh, it, was, it, was a, it was a huge success, and uh, he, w he was rolling. And um, then I, I think I came, came back and went from, from there to, uh, uh, I don't know which I did in Long Island, uh, or to, to Pennsylvania to put together a motorcade the, through through downtown Philadelphia, the the, uh, uh, the business community on Friday, the Walnut and, and Chestnut Streets, 
and uh, then we went on a tour of five different stops throughout all of Pennsylvania. And man, you, you know, I, I got to Pennsylvania and I got in the car and drove and drove and drove trying to figure out a route that would take us through Pennsylvania and then into New Jersey for two stops in New Jersey and then back to New York. And I think, you know, as far as a challenge was concerned, I mean, Philadelphia was okay because you had, you had your built-in crowd and you was going to see Cardinal Kroll first. That was an early morning stop. We picked up John Eisenhower, uh, and that that was all well and good. And then we took off going on the, uh, that that tour through the uh, through the various county, Bucks County, and uh, the various counties of, of uh, Pennsylvania, and then into uh, uh, New Jersey. And I I had recruited um, somebody to put at each one of these stops. So. Once we started going, you know, you got a crowd and you all said, are we, are we rolling, are we doing well? And it was, again, we, we, we went through there, we motorcaded the whole day, all through Pennsylvania and New Jersey. And the stops were, I don't know if they do that anymore, I don't know whether they can, but the, the stops were, were great. And, and he said in somewhere in New Jersey that, that we've had such a good day, let's put it in gear and, and uh, head for for New York and everybody can have a, have a nightcap somewhere because it's been a great day. And uh, it was. Uh, and then, that, then I headed for, for uh, New York for, to motorcade Long Island and put together Suffolk and Essex, Co Essex County to pick up Rockefeller at the Long Island border and uh, uh, take off from, from there and go through motorcade through Essex and, and Suffolk County. And, and and I remember meeting with this fellow, Joe, Joe Margiotta, in, uh, um, uh, I don't know where, where he, he was, but I came in there and he had his whole council. Margiotta subsequently got in a little trouble in, in politically, I don't know what it was for, but he, he did. But um, somebody wrote it up in Newsday. I didn't, didn't I wasn't written up in, in many things, but uh, somebody wrote it up that the, a telephone call came and the call was for the motorcade king, and they said uh, when that was announced, Cash and took the call. So I, the, the, they had the label put on me as the motorcade king. But uh, anyhow, that that was it. We motorcaded. The next thing uh, I did was flew to California, uh, to Long Beach, where the, there was a whole bunch of the guys. You know, you had you had a, uh, a nucleus of of people who uh, had become really close friends. Uh, Dwight Chapin. Ed Morgan, Nick Rui, um, uh, you know, Meat Ecker that, that, were, that were out there in California, that, that Ziegler, uh, Whale Han was aboard. Uh, um, I mean, I, you know, I, I'm just gonna think of, of uh, and I went to, uh, uh, Cicero went to Illinois for, for one event, and uh, was supposed to go to Cicero. And I had these volunteers in Cicero, and, and I'm from Detroit. Detroit Tigers were playing in the in the, the World Series, and um, I had this young <laughs> young I'm 25 or so, whatever it was, 26, and a, a young guy working for me. I mean, he's younger than me, and he uh, came in to get me at the headquarters there at Cicero and said, uh, "Hey, Cash, and I got uh, some guy on the phone uh, by the name of John Mitchell." He wants to talk to you. Want me to blow him off and tell him to get lost? I said, no, I better take that call. And that was turned out to be a very seminal time of the campaign because uh, Mitchell said, uh, I want you to, to cancel Cicero, get out of there, head up to Don Rumsfeld's district, put together a rally up there. We have got Illinois. We're going to take it. We want one last event. And this is early October. We got one last event. And uh, we're we're going to win Illinois, and we got to get to Pennsylvania, and we got to get to New Jersey. And uh, well, he was right. And uh, we lost Pennsylvania, we won New Jersey, and it made the it made the difference. Uh, anyhow, I can't remember when the sequence. I think that was the last one of the trips before we went to California. Uh, I don't know how it all fit in between between New York and and. Uh, and the, the, the stop in, in Illinois. But, uh, uh, you know, we went to, we had a, uh, there was a big telethon going on in, in uh, California and everybody was working. The, the guys were, I mean, they were, the, it was virtually all over. I mean, got on a plane, the plane, and went, went back to New York the next day and into the Waldorf for, for the election. Uh, that was a long night. I want to ask you, um, 
a question that takes us all the way back to the beginning of the story. Why weren't you, uh, why Nixon, why not Romney in 66, uh, 67? I, I got started with Nixon before Romney. Uh, it was, uh, you know, I got the opportunity with Nixon even, even though I uh, was uh, in the office of one of, my, uh, not my law partner, I was the young associate, and uh, one of the uh, he was a big time partner, Dick, Dick Van Dusen, uh, was Romney's uh, general counsel and his, probably his closest confidant, and I was in the office uh, with, because I started in 66, and Romney, Romney, you know, he didn't announce until, until 67, and uh, so he didn't have a campaign going, they were thinking about it, and they wanted me to go, to go to, take off and get involved with, with, with Romney, and uh, Van Dusen had Romney on the phone, and he said, uh, Governor, I got just the guy to take off and, and start doing the advance work for you. It's a question to him as to which is more important to him, his loyalties to, to Nixon or his job. <laughs> and I, he didn't mean the, the he didn't mean that, but he was he was sticking it to me. And, and I after we hung up, I said, you know, Dick, I'm I'm committed to Nixon. And uh, he said, that's the way it goes. Okay, go get him, and we'll see you on the campaign trail. And then he eventually came came to uh, um, Washington as Under Secretary to Romney when he was Secretary of Health. Was Governor Romney? It was, that was one of the departments I was responsible for when I was working in, as deputy counsel and did a lot of work with, with Romney and he, was a, he, was a, he became a great friend. I mean, I knew him a little bit as governor, but he was, he was a wonderful guy. And the next question is, uh, so John Mitchell singled out Don Rumsfeld's district because Rumsfeld's district was Chicago, Chicago land, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, it was Arlington or wherever it was. I, for, I forget, but, I mean, but it was- Winnetka, I think. Right, right, in, right around in there, it was, it was a safe district. And what he wanted was uh, a one good event that we didn't have to work too hard and it would, wouldn't wouldn't take a lot of uh, a lot of time, a lot of effort. It would it was you know it was going to be a good event. It was Republican territory. The people were going to turn out. It was going to be a good show. And then we headed off for Pennsylvania, New Jersey to to campaign in the states where we needed it. And you know that that was uh, a very rough call for for it was a bold call for Mitchell. Uh, and I think well into uh, uh, Nixon's term, he credited John Mitchell for making the tough calls that got him elected. And uh, uh, you know, we were walking in and out of the suite in the Waldorf. He was in a separate room, but you could go into kind of the, the uh, uh, living room area during the, the election. And, go, and, and um, at one point, he came out and was in a bathrobe in the Illinois uh, returns were coming in, and uh, they were not good. And uh, it was Chicago was coming in first, and he just walked out and looked at Mitchell and said, John, can we have a word in here a second? <laughs> and then when Southern Illinois came in, came in strong, and he won. Um, but that, that's the reason with, with, with my authority committed to Nixon, and I was having fun. I got to know the guys, got to know him, and uh, had, a, had a great experience. I want to back up because you mentioned a name that I think we're going to talk about, at least in passing, a little bit later. Cardinal Kroll in, uh, in Philadelphia. Who was he? Why was he, uh, why was he significant? Um, if uh, if I were just my, my personal opinion, um, Nixon because I did a lot of work in the White House with, with the Catholics and uh, um, the Catholic vote. Uh, Nixon felt a, uh, whether closeness is the, is the right word, um, uh, that he benefited from the input coming from the hierarchy of the Catholic Church. And obviously, uh, us drop by in Philadelphia an ethnic uh, city, uh, much more so that than than now. Uh, you know w uh, that a, a drop by to, to visit with the cardinal was um, it was a, it was a good move, and it started off 
a very um, you know, close, close maybe is too strong, but an excellent relationship between uh, Kroll and Nixon. As you, 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 I'm sure you know, Kroll was, I believe he was a native of Poland. I believe he was born in Poland and steeped in Eastern European uh, history, knowledge, politics, and he became a confidant of the president's during uh, his administration. And in 72, you have to check the records, I believe he was the, uh, the first archbishop of the church, cardinal of the, of, the, of the church to address a political convention. And from, uh, and there's a funny story with that, with that too. But uh, um, I don't know, the, the, the funny story is that uh, when I was in the White House, I used to talk to Cardinal Kroll all the time because Nixon wanted to know what he was thinking. Same with Cardinal Cook in, uh, in New York. And Cardinal Cook was a long time relationship with, with uh, uh, the president uh, before campaigns. I don't know how far back it went with Kroll. I think that was cultivated after he became, but um, uh, we d it was, you know, it was decided that it would be great to have a cardinal of the church deliver the invocation uh, to the for, for the start of the convention in '72, and uh, so um, I, I got the assignment to call Cardinal Kroll and uh, uh, called him and uh, said just was straightforward, and he said, uh, "Now, Henry, said, I think you're a smart man, but you're not asking the right." question. And I said, well, Your Eminence, I, I'm, I'm not sure uh, how, you, how you want it. And he said, well, let me put it this way. Uh, the man you're talking about, Mr. Nixon, what is he? I said, he's President of the United States. And who wants me to do the invocation? I said, the President of the United States. He said, no. It's not the Republican Party. It is the office of the President of the United States. And he said, if I get a call from the President of the United States, I will be inclined to accept. You got that now? I mean, and he had a great sense of humor. He used to like to mess around with me. Uh, as it turned out, he went up, he was on vacation um, somewhere in, I believe, New Jersey, playing golf. And uh, this was for 72, and, and uh, got, a, got the call um, up there in the White House, and Nixon you know, was calling him. And uh, he, he, they sent somebody out to get him off the golf course. And they said, well, John, you know, uh, what's the big deal? He said, well, I, I left word I only wanted to be disturbed if it was the pope or the president. And off he went to take the call. And he came back in, and everybody said, so what gives? He said, it wasn't the pope. <laughs> and uh, anyhow, he, uh, he delivered the, the, uh, the invocation. and. Uh, uh, that was a, that he, he just had a thing. There were a lot of places where he would stop and visit with the, the archbishop of whatever town he was in or uh, meet with, with various clergy. He, uh, he always felt that there was a pulse of a major city that a cardinal of the Catholic Church knew what was going on. The campaign is over. Richard Nixon has won. When do you make the decision that you're going to go to Washington or going to go back to Detroit? Um, well, you, you know, I, I was I had the had the bug at that point, but I came back to Detroit, went back to my law firm, and uh, then in uh, January, uh, I got a call from Ehrlichman to uh, come to Washington. I think it was it was first week in February, and there was no disclosure of what we were doing, where we were going. He said. Uh, uh, Get your, we've got your passport and your papers and everything else. We're, we're, we're going, we're leaving the country. And uh, I said, well, I, okay. And he said, just just show up. And uh, so I did. And <laughs> so I did, that's stupid. Uh, anyhow, um, we, uh, uh, we, there were, I'm trying to think of the guys that were on the trip, all assembled and uh, briefed, briefed briefly and uh, spent the night at the uh, Hay Adams Hotel, then took off uh, for Andrews and boarded a plane. And Ehrlichman uh, you know, was aboard and he, he was talking to 
to, okay, it was Ron Walker, myself, John Niedecker, uh, Danny Kingsley, and Easy Ed Morgan. And I was originally uh, going to London. And uh, we, were, we were back in the, in the, uh, the plane and, and doing the advance on that. And, and uh, Walker said, uh, uh, you know what? Why aren't you doing Vatican and Rome? And uh, I said, uh, I don't know. He said, well, this is crazy. You ought to be doing it. You're the only Catholic. In the, in the crowd, so he went up and asked John, and <laughs> John said, well, uh, I, that's what my original thought was to, to have Henry do Rome and the Vatican, uh, but he said, you know, I worry about whether or not his, his commitment to the Catholic Church might affect his ability to, to, to operate on behalf of the president. And, and Ron said, that's nuts. He said, he, he, he'll know how to handle that one, so we switched. and. Uh, we, we flew to, to Brussels, dropped off um, Kingsley, I guess, in Brussels. Uh, and I took off for um, uh, Berlin, I guess, uh, and, and to hook up with uh, Frank Borman, the astronaut, because Nick Ruri was his tour guide at that point. He was running his tour to, in, to experience, um, where was it? No, I went to Bonn. Germany from Berlin from Brussels I went to Bonn and uh, uh, and hooked up with with Bormann and then we went to Italy after that and to, to experience what what type of trip uh, Bormann was having Colonel Bormann having circled the, the moon well he was an international big-time hero and everywhere he went they were all yelling moon man and all there's no controversy nobody throwing tomatoes or anything at him I mean it was you know, it was a great time I just rode along and observed and uh, uh, got to Rome and uh, waited for the rest of the gang to come to Rome and uh, uh, and we did I stayed in Rome they went on to to France and uh, back home and during that time Ehrlichman had you know marked off where we were going had an idea of every place that that was involved and it was, it was a great trip it was a wonderful trip um, you know and he got Back, he being Earlman got back to Washington, and then we were putting the schedule together. He he had a we had a transatlantic conference call that lasted all day long, with guys on the phone from everywhere you were, and he he had it, you know, okay, where are we going to lay the wreath? Where are we going to do this? Where are we going to do that? And uh, um, you know, I went over and met with the people in the Vatican. It was just me there, and. Uh, uh, the, 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 my counterparts, we had a good support from the embassy, counterparts from the Italian government, and uh, there was only, only one guy from, from the Vatican, a couple of them, Monsignor McHugh, and it was, it was strikingly different in the attitude that uh, we took with the Vatican, uh, and that Johnson had come in there before, right before he went out of office, and he crashed. You might recall he, his helicopter hit a high wire. They were landing in back of uh, St. Peter's Basilica, and they hit a high, a high wire, and the helicopter crashed, and an agent was killed. And uh, then when they came to the time for exchange of gifts, they brought in a um, huge press pool. I mean, it wasn't even a pool, but they just flooded the place, and Pope John, uh, Pope Paul VI was a very little man, and he was frail, but smart and alert and with it and everything, and, and uh, uh, they did, everybody just stampeded in there, and, and when it came time for the exchange of gifts, uh, that, that Johnson, first of all, he asked a hey, aide for a knife, he popped a switchblade knife, which sent the Swiss guards up the wall, Took, then took the knife and put it down one way this way, one way that way on the box, and then pulled out a bust of himself, and he handed it to His Holiness and said, how do you like that, Pope? And uh, so when I, I told Monsignor McHugh that we were having a small, limited press pool, which would be, there were about six or seven Catholics in, on the, in the group, maybe not even that many, maybe there were five of us, Rosemary Woods, me, There was a young, young uh, military aide by the name of Elmer Junick that worked for Haldeman. He, he was a Catholic. And then the, the principals, Kissinger, Rogers, uh, 
I think uh, General Hughes was a board. Anyhow, there was about eight or ten staff, and that was it. And there would be no open exchange of gifts. There would be closed exchange of gifts, and the, the press pool would be limited to four or five. And McHugh said, and that's it? I said, that's it. He said, I'll tell you, you have made my day, my trip. He said, His Holiness is going to be delighted. He said, this is, he said, we're, we're done. Uh, so if you need me for anything, um, I'm, I'm available. So it was a, it was a great trip. And we, and then uh, he went, you know, made the whole trip. Uh, we came to Rome, then he went back to France, and he came back for the trip with the Vatican. And after he met with the Pope, we were the first, first, time anybody has landed right in St. Uh, Peter's Square. It, uh, uh, when we took off, the Pope came out onto the balcony and then we brought the helicopters up and held uh, right out in front of the porch and he gave a papal blessing to the two helicopters and we tipped them and flew back to Cipriani and then out. And so it was a, it was a, it was a great trip. Uh, we landed. Uh, John talked to me. After that, I came up to see him when we got back and uh, said, I'd like you to come aboard as deputy counsel. And uh, I said, you know, let me uh, get back home, just check, check say hello to my wife. <laughs> yeah, and and uh, uh, I, I remember uh, uh, talking to uh, my father's lawyer in Detroit. And he said, "The only he said you're going to do it. You're nuts if you don't do it." Uh, but he said, "Like you go talk to David Kendall, who was formerly counsel to Dwight Eisenhower and uh, who was pra practicing attorney, former general counsel of Chrysler." And I went in to see Mr. Kendall, who's a young guy, and said, "Do you think I ought to do it or whatever?" He said, "You're going to break your father's heart because I know how close you guys are, and you know you eventually probably end up practicing law together." But he said, "Only thing I can tell you is how fast can you pack your bags? Get out of here, Henry, and take the job and get going." So I left that week, and it was sometime in March, um, and you know we're headed into to uh, start the job at the White House as deputy counsel. What did you think the uh, job was going to be? What was your portfolio? when you took the job as deputy counsel? I, I had no idea. Uh, I, I mean, I really didn't. Um, and this is working for John Ehrlichman. Yeah. And Sears was already there. You know, you're talking about whether it was legal work. I mean, uh, uh, there were, um, Morgan was there. He was the deputy counsel. Sears was the deputy counsel. I was. Bud Krogh was a staff guy. He wasn't a deputy counsel yet. Uh, and uh, I don't know what Whitaker's title was. Whit Whitaker eventually got the title of cabinet secretary, um, but I don't know. We maybe had something before that. So there were there were three of us. Sears was doing political work all the time. I mean, he he didn't he didn't, he didn't bother with the council's office. So it was me and Morgan. And um, I didn't have a clue what I what I was going to be doing. You know, I mean, I, I uh, was admitted to the bar in 1964, so I barely had two years of uh, legal practice. Uh, so I wasn't a real veteran of, of legal experience, uh, but I had a lot of political experience in a short period of time. And um, then John eventually divided up the departments, and uh, I became the liaison man with the uh, Housing and Urban Development, Department of Transportation, the Post Office, and the Civil Service Commission. And I was a point man for everything that was going on with those those departments, and uh, you know, it's a, geez, we had the we had the, uh, the in the first year the, the postal strike, we had the air traffic controllers strike. Those were two of my my departments, and uh, uh, you know, I, there was no shortage of work. It was seven o'clock staff meeting every morning and, and going strong. And it, but it was you know it was it was fun. And there was a great group of guys and. You know the, the uh, White House mess that people would meet in there. They were they were they'd have a drink at the end of the day. And I remember Al Haig coming in all the time, and Kissinger would stick his head in and and start yelling at Haig, and Haig would say, "I don't know what the hell he's yelling about. I'm going to stick around all night and do all his work for him." He said so. He said, "I'm going to sit here and relax for a while." And I mean, it was it was it was fun. Uh, you know, you knew General Hughes, you knew Ziegler, you knew Jerry Warren, you knew Wheelahan, you knew the guys in the press office. Uh, Chapin, Steve Bull, Haldeman, uh, Larry Higby. I mean, they were, it was like, it was an old. Th this this was the gang that was, you know, really very 
close to each other and uh, uh, loyal. Uh, I didn't say loyal to a fault. Loyal. Nobody, nobody was out seeking any any uh, that came later with later staff. But there, out of that group that started, nobody was looking for for exposure in the press, for for looking for any adulation. I mean, I think Bob kind of set the level that boys. We're work, we got we all got one guy that we're working for and if he does well we all do well and uh, the best advice I, I got coming in there was from Harlow we used to joke around he used to call me Reverend because of the work with the with the Catholics and uh, I was getting around one day and he said Reverend let me just tell you one thing he said I want you to be the same guy going out of this office as you are coming in and he said, uh, because you remember one thing, that you are nothing. He said, the important thing that people reflect on is you're in here and you got a title and you got an office in the White House and they're going to want to use you. And they're going to kiss your rear end as a young guy and it might be pretty impressionable because they want something. So just remember, it's not you that's, <laughs> that's anything. You're just a warm body who happens to have a place in the White House. And he said, as long as you remember that, you're the same guy going out of here as you were coming in, and at the end of the day, you return all your telephone calls, you're going to be okay. And he said, let's have some fun. It was the best advice, you know, I ever got. Um, anyhow, uh, I worked for John in uh, those, those departments and, and had fun working with him, worked hard. We did you know, a lot of hours, went out back and forth to San Clemente. Uh, uh, you know, I remember when, when uh, uh, Ehrlichman said, would you, would you work with um, uh, DeMarco out in California? I think his name was DeMarco, uh, who was one of Herb Comeback's law partners on uh, transferring the, the papers uh, out there um, to, the, to uh, de donate them to the, to the Nixon Library. Um, we, you know, we could take the take. We could take a, a tax deduction and donate them. And uh, um, I said, sure. You know, and so I was going to go back and forth to California a few times. And Morgan said, uh, um, you know, he said, I got a girlfriend out there. Do you mind if if I take over this this stuff? But then I forget what he it was. Any Herb Comeback's partner? They had a very successful law partner. Comeback was very involved. And and. Uh, uh, so I said, it's all right with John, it's okay with me. I didn't have a right across the hall from me. I mean, we had a suite of offices between us. And uh, um, so I don't know, later going on, Ed went out there and he was doing the job and they were going to donate the, 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 uh, uh, the papers to uh, whomever they were donating to while well, they still were able to take, the, take a deduction for the donation of the papers. And uh, the pile is still sitting on Ed's desk and I said, Ed, what are you doing with these things? And he said, I would take care of it. Not, it's not a big deal. I said, it is a big deal unless you got it taken care of. I, I, you know, it's your deal. But, uh, man, and that's how he got in trouble. Crazy, because Ed, Ed was a good guy, real good guy. And Krogh, the same way. Krogh was a, was a good guy. He said, if you want to find him, probably one of the most honest, if I want to say one of the most honest people I've ever known in my life was Bud Krogh. Uh, and I worked for John. Uh, and had a, had a great time, uh, a lot of exposure to the post office, to Red Blunt, to Romney, to John Volpe. Uh, you know, it was a very heady stuff for, for a young guy, but it was, it was fun. Uh, my son was born, the first child born in 1970. Um, and then Harlow came up with this idea with Colson of uh, starting the office of public liaison. And they cooked it up and, and Bryce said, uh, Chuck, why don't, why don't you you go to work with with Chuck and uh, see if you can make something out of out of the office? Uh, and so I did, and uh, and that was a lot of fun. I did that for we did worked on all sorts of stuff for until you know January of '73. So I was in the council's office for over a year until we switched when OMB from Bureau of the Budget became the Office of Management and Budget. I want to back up and ask you um, to give us quick sketches of the characters uh, of some of the men you've mentioned. What was John Ehrlichman like? I liked John a lot. I, I did, did a lot of a lot of work for him because he was he was John was uh, 
film the tour director. He was on the plane, and he was he and, he and Bob were, were responsible for, for the, the campaign. But when it came time to moving the candidate around, all during the the uh, um, the uh, campaign, it was John who you who you're taking your orders from, you were talking to if you had serious problems, whatever. So I got to know him real well. Never had a problem with John. Uh, Ever, uh, I mean that that was uh, anytime he was accessible, he was very bright. Uh, you know there are a lot of lot of uh, it's, it, occasions that I remember. You know things going down, the firing of Wally Hickel, uh, the, the, the going through the, the postal strike, the air traffic controller strike, the dealing with Ed Williams with that, what was that crazy lawyer's name who was representing the air traffic controllers, F. Lee Bailey. Who you know showed up drunk? At, uh, he didn't show up drunk. He didn't show up for to try and raise out. I'm getting off track, but but anyhow, Ehrlichman I, I thought was uh, he was he had, had a uh, wonderful wife and a great family, and if there was you know uh, um, a lousy side to him, if uh, whatever whatever I never saw it. Uh, John was as far as I was concerned was was accessible. He was fair. He had a great sense of humor, and I enjoyed working with him. And uh, he was he was a good guy, you know. In addition, that that first year was a lot of travel. I took the first trip to Europe, took a trip around the world in in, in July, then went back to Ireland in in uh, in the fall when he went back. So, you know, I was gone a fair amount of that time. But um, uh, John John, as far as I was concerned, same with Bob. We you know everybody worked for Bob, and uh, in that you know he was chief of staff. But uh, my my directions and what I was doing came from came from Ehrlichman and um, you know I, I've got nothing but very positive things to say about John and we, and that we remained friends up until I talked to him right before he died in the hospital at the nurse said uh, he, he can't talk but he can hear you and she put the phone up and I said goodbye to him on the, on the phone and, and he knew he was dying he took himself off dialysis but um, you know it was, it was rough for me to accept what eventually happened to him because here's a guy who had a huge, very successful law practice in Seattle. He didn't need all of this. And, um, you know, he, he had, I guess he, he, he uh, you know, he could have been rough. He had, he was, he uh, um, was capable of dealing with, with, with people the way he had to deal with them. But uh, uh, my experience with him was, was, was great. I thought he was a wonderful guy. Bob Haldeman. Haldeman was the same way. I mean, uh, Haldeman I respected uh, all the way. Bob, uh, as long as you were straight with him and he knew that you, you, were, you didn't have a separate agenda, that your loyalty was to the President of the United States, which, he, you know, I'm not patting myself on the back, but mine was. And I, I didn't, I, 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 you know, you almost were afraid to try and you know, talk to a reporter or something so your name would show up in the paper that somebody would, uh, uh, you know, Bob, uh, I, I laughed with him. Uh, whenever I, I needed anything from him, I was, he was, I was accessible. Um, you know, I mean, he, he was a guy, I, I agreed with Walter Cronkite one time when he, he was talking to me and Ziegler uh, down at, he spoke at, uh, when Ziegler was president of the, the Chain Drug Store Association and, uh, we were in the holding room and with, with Cronkite before he spoke, and he said, I just want to tell you guys something, that Haldeman was one guy who was not over his head as chief of staff. The guy had the capability of running that place, and he ran it wonderfully. He, uh, uh, you know, he, he, he never left till anybody, everybody else was out of there. He was around there till 8, 9 o'clock at night, first guy in the office in the morning. Never gave very rarely, if any, talked to the press. Never sought any any notoriety for himself other than what the press managed to give to him. Um, I mean, he 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 was he was a tough guy. Uh, and Ehrlichman had a sense of humor, and so did Bob. Um, it, maybe if they'd encouraged a little more humor and taken things a little lighter, Bob in particular, not J John. John had. You know, John could could laugh at himself. So could Bob, but uh, uh, anyhow, they were 
dedicated public servants who were both smart as, as can be, and, and Bob in particular was a very bright guy. He, I mean, he could devour and consume the paperwork and knowledge of, of anything that was coming his way, and he ran a tight ship. When did you first meet Chuck Colson? Uh, when he when he came to the White House, uh, I guess I might have met him some somewhere during you know the inaugural stuff or something like that. But I I didn't meet him. We had we had a little bit of affinity with each other. We'd both gone to Brown. Uh, he was working right right to, you know when he first started off uh, um, in the office right right close to where I was. Uh, and I, I hit it off with Chuck. We got along great. We had a lot of fun with each other. Um, uh, and I thought he was a good guy. And uh, so we, you know, we, we, we uh, uh, it was, I didn't, but I didn't really meet him until he came aboard. Hartle brought him aboard, uh, came into the White House. And uh, then he came up with this idea of the Office of Public Liaison and, and running that thing. And that's where that took off. And, and I switched. Uh, which I'm, I'm glad I did from going to, then when the domestic council came in and all of that sort of stuff because I I, 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 re I mean I really had fun doing the Office of Public because we were dealing with outside organizations all over the place and meetings and and you know it was it was fun uh, and substantive so uh, then you know when, when 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 I started to work with Chuck then I was in, in the right in the office right next to him the, a suite of offices and uh, moved down from where I was next to Morgan and uh, we did a, did a lot of stuff together and uh, uh, you know I still see Chuck today uh, I was re he's the reason I joined the law firm where I met Charlie Morin his former former partner who became a, a dear friend and uh, you know Chuck was a hard charger I mean, he has no question about it. I mean, he he, uh, he went for the juggler, and, and uh, he was dedicated to getting the job done, and uh, and he did. Uh, you know, some might say he he, uh, uh, he 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 didn't know when to read the stop sign, <laughs> but uh, you know, it uh, um, that was a great experience. And Chuck Chuck was just, Chuck's a very smart, capable guy. What was the original idea for the Office of Public Liaison? To bring outside input to, to the Office of the President, to the, to the White House staff, uh, from uh, the business community, the, the Jewish community, the Catholic community, the, the entertainment, uh, um, you name it. I mean, from the labor unions. I mean, that's how Chuck got involved with, with Peter Brennan and the AFL-CIO and developed a, a, um, a rapport with, with, with those guys. Uh, and it was it was a great idea. Harlow and Chuck cooked it up, and uh, we I mean we had meetings, you know when we were when we were going going for government re government re reorganization. Uh, that w that was one big thing. They're going to going to divide up the departments or consolidate uh, the departments. Um, and there was one major major other initiative that, that we had the br anytime there was a briefing from outside groups, or trade association groups, private business groups. Uh, you know, we'd bring him in, talk to him about the priorities of the president. Uh, you know, I ended up bringing athletes and entertainers and clergy and, and a group of uh, Sarfitic Jews. Uh, into, I mean, you know, it was it, it was it was it was an exciting time. And, and uh, Sammy Davis Jr., Ted Williams, uh, Carl Yastrzemski. You know, I mean, it was outside because the president was a sports nut. And uh, um, you know, I mean, so. Uh, that was it was to make sure we were we were we were getting the input from the outside groups that that uh, needed to, to offer the White House um, the benefit of what they thought we were doing right or wrong and uh, anyhow that's uh, uh, we did that for uh, from sometime mid 1970 uh, uh, early 1970, I guess, till I left in 73. Uh, Your portfolio was uh, pretty broad. You had celebrities, a uh, bit of labor, uh, a large part of the Catholic portfolio and so forth, and you worked closely with Chuck Colson on these issues, obviously. 
what were your goals? How did you get there? How did you reach out to Catholics? You spent a lot of time talking to a hierarchy, but you also worked with the Knights of Columbus and other groups. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was it was for for in in a lot of ways talking to a hierarchy was to um, get their advice on um, what they considered the priority issues affecting the country uh, and what was the pulse of of their people, what were they were they talking about, uh, and what was coming to their attention. Um, you know, it, and it was uh, the the objective was to explain to any of the outside organizations, uh, not necessarily the entertainers. They they were ones that, that, in a lot of different ways, they were used used not in a bad way and good way, but. Uh, uh, it, it was to explain where the president was on, on a particular issue, and, and with, with he was he was in favor of you know aid to non-public schools. He was uh, anti-abortion. Uh, you know he was on all fours on the Catholic issues to make sure that the uh, that the, uh, uh, the the Catholics knew that that and Nixon really believed. I mean you know he was the silent majority and all of that. He he was convinced that that he had a wide open shot at the uh, uh, ethnic America, that, that um, he could relate to them and talk to them, that they were the patriots, they were good people, they were family people, and that, that that's where he wanted to deliver his focus. And he did. And uh, the Catholic Church happened to be one large element of that, that um, uh, we were available to, to uh, explain what he was doing and to get their input and what, what he needed to concentrate on. If anything. But he was on all fours as far as the issues that the, the, the Catholic Church had to deal with. And uh, that, you know, it's one of the reasons you talked to the Cardinal. The Cardinals were more Cook, Kroll, uh, in particular for input coming back to him. Kroll would come in and he and Nixon would, would putt in his office and they'd talk about Eastern Europe, which Nixon was fascinated on, what was going on in Poland, how strong were the communists, uh, you know, and, they, and, and, and Kroll was very knowledgeable. Um, you know, with the athletes, uh, and you know, some some of them, uh, they they undertook programs, charitable programs, anti Sammy Davis Jr. anti drug programs. Uh, they they uh, uh, Nixon was he he loved sports. He loved the, the, uh, to communicate with the athletes, and and uh, there were some of them that he Arnold Palmer. I mean, you know, those were those were those were guys he wanted to visit with. That I Miss America, who wanted to see the president, and he he he, he you know. Coming in and say, "What am I see Miss America for?" <laughs> and, and Bob said, "It's good for you to be around Miss America." But uh, um, so Wilt the Stilt instead of uh, Wilt the Stilt. I don't know what happened to Wilt the Stilt. I, he, I mean, at least for me, he never came back. But Ted Williams came back, and, and uh, uh, a lot of football players: Floyd Patterson, the boxers, Sammy Davis, George Allen. Uh, George Allen. Yeah, I mean, you know, he he uh, uh, had a lot of them in there. I mean, it was. Uh, but we had, an, and then the business community, the agriculture community, uh, there was all of that stuff about the dairy farmers. The dairy farmers were in there, and that was, Pat Hillings was representing them. But, uh, uh, you know, Nixon was, he wanted to meet with them to find out what was going on, to get their support on, on uh, farm subsidies and that. Well, I want to ask you um, briefly about one subset of this because there's, a, at least it struck me as unusual. Uh, I think there was a, uh, a day or a morning or a weekend, I can't remember which, when NASCAR drivers, uh, race car drivers came to the White House, and I think you were involved in that to mm -hmm. some extent. Yeah. Can you tell us about that? Well, it, it, that, that was it. it you, you know, we find people focused on what a huge sport this was, and uh, that, hey, th this is a crowd that, that uh, maybe nobody's paying attention to, but we ought to. That they are bigger and bigger all the time, and this is a constituency that that uh, we'd, we'd like their support. So maybe we ought to do something for them. And uh, then the idea of a, of a White House reception for the for the NASCAR drivers, and then you had all of the big guys <laughs> that we made contact with. And not only was it a colorful event, but it, but it associated Nixon with. NASCAR racing, NASCAR drivers, in the South, uh, in that that part of the world that that he 
was looking to develop and uh, not develop, to hold and cultivate and expand on. And uh, so, you know, we, we had all these cars parked around the, 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 west, the uh, west circle of the, of, of the White House uh, in front of the, the uh, uh, porticos there. And, and you know, Richard Petty, you, you know, all of the, the big time drivers had a great reception. And it was, uh, it was a wonderful time. But um, I thought John Damgard knew a lot of these guys. He was working for Agner that he got, he got involved. And we took off and just started you know, making contact with the drivers and the sponsors, and, and before long, we, we, you know, Andy Granatelli, that we, we had the whole works, and uh, uh, it was a great event. And it was, you know, Nixon was, he, 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 he had a sense for, you know, traveling around in Ireland, and uh, you'd, you'd go by uh, an orphanage, and you'd, you would, you would see an, a nun out there with, with a handful of these great looking, ruddy faced little kids, and Boy, he would stop, you know, that motorcade, and uh, out he'd go, you know, and, and uh, uh, he would walk back to where all the kids and the nun were saying, of course, all of them were saying, "Wow, what a what a photo opportunity we got here!" And it was, I mean, it was it was wonderful. And those, were the, I mean, his instincts on on politics were were great. That was, I mean, backing up, but that was a great trip we had to, to Ireland. Uh, Let's talk about that trip because uh, uh, I'm. I'm Personally interested in this, uh, not because anybody I know was involved, but this is this is a fairly long trip. It's um, well, he took he went to Europe again right. for his second trip to Europe in the fall of 1970. And this is the end of that. Hmm? And this is at the end of that trip, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Why Ireland? Why then? Uh, well, of course, Mrs. Nixon was Irish, Pat Ryan, and uh, that and, and the Millhouse side of Nixon was Irish. So uh, one of one of the President's biggest supporters was a fellow by the name of John Mulcahy, and Mulcahy wanted him to come to Ireland, and uh, so when he was making this trip, um, you know, they came to the conclusion, uh, not that I had anything to do with the decision, but for all of those reasons, Mulcahy pushing hard, and he was a huge financial supporter, uh, and um, with Pat being from from. Uh, uh, and her family heritage in Ireland and the Millhouse side of the things and there was a Quaker cemetery over there uh, outside of Dublin. So all those things said, let's go. And uh, <laughs> it, was, it was a great trip. I mean, uh, it, it, it was wonderful. I mean, uh, you know, I was over there uh, by myself at, at, for, for, the, for the first part of it till we got organized and Mulcahy had this he, he very wealthy uh, Irish American. He had a big home in, in uh, um, Hospital Ireland, which was his regular house. Then he had a big um, uh, apartment in the Gresham Hotel in Dublin. And then he had his, his fishing villa up in Waterville, Ireland. And, uh, you know, we drove, drove around looking for where we were going to go, what we were going to do. And the president was staying. He was going to go to the cemetery. And uh, um, uh, the, the cemetery we went to Ireland. And Prime Minister, then it was out to Mulcahy's house in Hospital Ireland where he stayed. And, uh, but, uh, I mean, he covered a lot of part, a lot of Ireland, but it was, uh, it was a great trip. The Irish are great people, wonderful reception. Uh, we went a big, we went to Mullen Castle, a big, uh, press reception there. We went to, uh, the cemetery, uh, which was a Quaker burial cemetery, and that was in Timahoe, Ireland, which was the name of the, of his, his dog. Uh, then in to meet with, with uh, Jack Lynch was the, was the Taoiseach, the Prime Minister, in a, a state luncheon, and then out to uh, uh, Mulcahy's after that for a, for a state dinner. But um, it was, you know, I was, I was over there for a couple of weeks before he came, and uh, it was, I mean, it was great fun. Uh, and, you know, you can say it was great fun. Uh, the on reflection, but it was a lot of work because you're covering a lot of territory when you're when you're over there and you you're meet by yourself and the eight Secret Service agents. But I had the pleasure of meeting President De Valera. Uh, I went to his house, uh, had a glass of sherry with him. As you know, he was blind and he was 92 or 93 at that point. Big tall man, uh, stood straight up erect, and I mean, it was um, John Moore was our ambassador and. Uh, Anyhow, it was those 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 foreign 
trips where he loved them. He loved to sit one-on-one -on -one with whoever the head of state was, find out what was going on, and to match wits and exchange, you know, ideas with our allies, with our non-allies, whoever it was. Trip to the Philippines in in '69. Uh, we we were on schedule to meet with the, the opposition leader, and. Uh, um, the Marcos people said, we don't want you to meet with the Marcos, with the opposition leader, I forget what, the, what his name was. Was it uh, Nino Aquino? Hmm? Uh, Aquino? I think so, yeah. And uh, so, so, well, you know, he, we're on schedule to meet with him, and he said, well, we might, we might uh, you know, object to that, and, uh, um, you know, you, you shouldn't meet with him. And, and uh, word came back from Washington, I call, Either if we either meet with them or we fly right over the Philippines. So you can tell Marcos people that if they don't want us to stop, that's the thing to do. We we, we met with them, uh, but that that was that was a great trip to the Philippines. I mean, uh, Melinda Marcos, <laughs> she she was something else. I mean, uh, I, 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 I I kept talking back to Washington, talked to Whitaker about about the trip, and I said, man. This gal is is a tough lady. She's all over me to change plans and do this, that, and the other thing. And he said, "You better slow up." You know, have you had your room swept? And I said, "Boy, I, I, I haven't." Uh, and so they sent the guy from the CIA, and uh, um, uh, he checked it out. And I said, uh, "How we do? We clean?" He said, "Yeah, you're clean." He said, "You got enough power in here to equal that that uh, moon rocket that's about ready to lift off <laughs> on the front lawn of the or wherever they were going from." So. Anyhow, they, they had bugged my whole room. Uh, but anyhow, that we, I don't know where we were, but uh, um, that, was, that was a great trip. Well, let's talk a little bit more about uh, the labor issues. Um, there's one thing I want to come back to. Is there uh, a men's room I could use? Sure, just absolutely. Let's uh, take a break. Yeah. I uh, looked through your office files actually last week preparing for this. Um, Murray Chotner, you worked a little bit with him. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I worked with uh, uh, with Chotner. Um, you know, on, on political stuff, I, I, I like Murray. Uh, and I remember our first contact I had with Murray was in, in Miami at the convention in 1968 when after Agnew was, was named and uh, the bunch of us contemporary young guys, uh, I remember Chapin was with me and we, we went in to see Murray, we were worried about Agnew, who was he, we didn't know who he was and he was lying in the bed in, in his room with a, with a drink on his stomach, he had a stomach that kind of came out a little bit and, and he said, I don't know what you guys are all worried about. He said, there has never been a vice president who has made any difference in an election with the exception of Lyndon Johnson. And he said, the only, a, a, a vice president can never really help you, but he can hurt you. But he said, I don't think this guy is going to make any difference at all. And uh, then he came to the White House and he would show up at political meetings and um, you know, I, 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 I liked him as a person. That's with my, my communications. I used to love to get the benefits of his political insight. And uh, uh, so I, n I never did a lot of work with Murray other than, than to, to talk to him and, and uh, engage in, in political conversation about his thoughts of what was going on. But the most telling thing is I ran into him in his law firm. I, I didn't have much contact with, with committee to reelect the president creep. I don't know, I went over there once, and I was coming down, and uh, I saw Randy Chotner was, was in a law firm over there. He and Hillings were together. I forget who they were with. Maybe they were, were they with Marion Harrison? Maybe they, I, I don't know who they were with. But uh, Chotner um, said, come on in, and let's, let's have a drink. So we went in there having a drink, we're talking, and he said, you've been upstairs? And I said, yeah, so what'd you think? And I said, not much. And uh, he said, I tell you, it's worse than that because Maury Stans has raised more money than any other finance chairman in history. And he said, Mitchell, his mind is, is elsewhere. He's not focusing on running the place. He's got trouble at home, and that is driving him off his focus. 
and he's 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 drifting. He's letting everybody run, and he said there are a bunch of guys up there who have no idea what they're doing, and they're going to get in trouble. And he said I called the old man to let him know that we he doesn't even need a committee. We can run this thing out of the White House, and he's going to win so easily. And uh, um, Bob called me back, and I gave Bob the benefit of my thoughts. And he said talk to the old man. And he said so. I've let him know. And that's it. But that's the most you know the most um, uh, telling thing about Chotner. He he was next thing he knew he was he was in an automobile accident uh, out in front of Ted Kennedy's house, and, and Kennedy was responsible for getting him to Sibley Hospital, and they moved him from there, and he died of the, the uh, blood clot. But uh, you know I, I didn't do a lot of work with Chotner other than if we were touching base on um, what somebody would say okay, you know see what, what Chotner thinks about such and such an issue or whatever. But uh, I liked him. I mean he was he was a friend. Well, I just saw the name yeah. came up and it was uh, you he, know he uh, he was he was a friend. I knew Nancy's wife and, and I worked with her at conventions and years after. She's a nice lady. 